My name is Marianne and I am the Education Director with the Atlantic White Shark Conservancy. Um, we are a nonprofit organization based on Cape Cod. Uh, Cape Cod is a region of Massachusetts and we work to conserve white sharks. And the way that we do this uh, is by working in research, education and public safety. So it's those three core areas that we really believe will help to conserve white sharks. And as we go through this video, and if you've been watching our other lessons, um, a white shark is a great white shark. So they are the same thing. Um, but I know for myself, when you're saying white or great white shark, great white shark all the time, it gets to be a bit of a mouthful. Um, so that's why I call them white sharks, uh, just because it can be a bit easier to say, but just want to make sure everyone at home knows that a great white shark is a white shark as we go through these videos and we talk about them. But we're excited to be back today with our lesson, which is going to include some demonstrations for you all to see to really illustrate what we're talking about today. Uh, and then at the end, I really encourage some of you to investigate further. So I'm going to go over how you can have your own investigation at home. We're going to go ahead and we are going to get started with our lesson this morning. Um, and I'm really excited to look at this lesson with all of you um, because this is really answering the question, can a shark sink? Okay, you know, when we think about sharks and, you know, doesn't matter which species we're talking about, it could be looking at the white shark, it could be looking at a tiger shark, a bull shark, a whale shark. You know, when we see them in the water and we see how they're moving, you know, we often see them somewhere, you know, below the surface. Sometimes from videos, you can tell that they're down deep. Sometimes we do see them swimming along the ocean floor, you know, but I know I've often had that question, you know, well, could the shark actually sink to the bottom? Or, you know, you could look at it the other way and why don't sharks float at the surface? Why aren't they always up there, okay? So this is the questions that, or these are the questions that we are going to investigate in our lesson today, okay? And to get our brain thinking about this, okay? And really trying to reflect on, can a shark actually sink, all right? Why don't we take a look at this video of a great white shark, okay? So this video, was actually taken off the Isla of Guadalupe. Um, and I took this video myself when I was cage diving uh, with these white sharks in this area. So you can actually see a bit of the cage there. And you notice that this shark is, you know, not just sinking, but it's not just at the surface. The shark actually has that ability to be moving up and down. Um, but the depth in this region where we were and, you know, our cage was just below the surface there. You can actually, if you look at the top of your screen, you can see the water surface up there. Um, you know, but looking at this and really understanding, you know, why is it that the shark doesn't stay stuck at the surface? You know, if you think of things that maybe you drop in the water, you often notice that they're either going to, you know, float right there at the surface or they're going to sink down to the bottom. You know, so what is it that enables sharks to be somewhere in the middle, okay? And that's the goal for them. For a lot of sharks, they want to be somewhere in the middle. They don't want to always be at the surface. They don't always want to be down at the bottom. They want to be somewhere in the middle of what we call the water column, okay? And so, um, you know, how is it that they're able to be there in the middle of the water column? And that's what we're going to start to investigate here. And it's actually a combination of things. Okay, it's not just a one answer that I can give you for how sharks are able to be there somewhere in the middle. Um, and in fact, as I said, it is a combination. So let's take a look at what some of those things are that allow sharks or prevent them from just sinking down to the bottom or being stuck floating at the surface. So the first has to do, okay, with cartilage. Um, and the reason, you know, we're looking at this, cartilage is less dense than bone. And this is a pretty big statement. So let's break it down. First, let's remember what is cartilage? Who at home remembers what cartilage is? Okay. Some people are talking about how we have cartilage in our nose and we have cartilage in our ear. Okay. So cartilage is different than bone because it's more flexible. Okay. That's one thing. Um, and when we talk about cartilage in, you know, respect to sharks, 
what part of their body is made up of cartilage? All right, it is in fact their skeleton. So a shark skeleton is entirely made up of cartilage. They don't have any bones in their body, okay? And this is one of the defining characteristics that makes a shark unlike other fish, okay? Because a shark is a fish in that it has gills for breathing and fins for locomotion, but it's different than other species in that their entire skeleton is made up of cartilage. So we call them a cartilaginous fish compared to bony fish like a tuna that have a skeleton made up of bone. Hence the reason they're called bony fish, all right? But so since cartilage is less dense than bone, this is one of the things that helps prevent a shark from just sinking down to the ocean floor, okay? And so if we look further at this statement, now that we're remembering what cartilage is, that word dense and looking at just the word density, okay? Let's review what this means and then we're gonna get into our demonstration here, all right? So when we talk about density, all right? Density is the amount of mass per unit of volume. And we can look at this mathematically and you can actually calculate the density of an object by using the formula density equals mass divided by volume, okay? So I know this probably doesn't make sense when you think of it, the amount of mass per unit of volume. So let's break this down even further. When we're talking about the mass in something, we're talking about the volume, the volume is looking at the shape or the structure that some object takes, okay? And when we're looking at mass, mass is looking at the amount of molecules that are then in that object. Everything is made up of molecules. Everything has a mass. So for an example here, if we have two boxes, okay? So as you can see, we have a blue box and then we have a green box. Now they both, it looks like, have the same shape, the same structure, right? So their volume would likely be the same. But if we really looked inside and broke down the molecules, the blue box has all of these molecules crammed inside compared to the green box that doesn't have as many molecules inside, okay? So this means the amount of stuff that's inside is different compared from the blue box to the green box. So that means these two items are not gonna have the same density. The one that has more stuff, okay, inside of it, the blue one, that one would be more dense. So again, density is really looking at the amount of, you know, stuff, that is inside an object, and that's gonna calculate its density. Now, we're not gonna get into the mathematical part of this today. We are gonna investigate this just by making some observations, okay? And specifically, we're gonna make an observation about cartilage, since we are saying that cartilage is less dense than bone. So I'm going to pull my bin of water over, and I'm actually gonna adjust my screen so you can see down at this right now, okay? So I have a tub here of just tap water. Um, you know, if you are at home and you're gonna try this, you could even mix in some salt and try to make your own salt water combination here. But for me today, I'm just using tap water from the sink, all right? And then I have a piece of cartilage here. So this is an actual piece from a shark. It's a piece of the spine. So as we said, every part of a shark skeleton is in fact made out of cartilage. Um, and sharks are vertebrates, meaning that they have a spine. So, and their spine is similar to a human spine in that it is made up of these discs. We call each one of these a centra piece. Um, and so, you know, we have this disc of the spine here. So I have one of those, but in the full spine, there would be, you know, this series of discs, as you can see. And then I also have a whalebone fossil, okay? Now I did my best to find two pieces, you know, looking at this, a piece of cartilage compared to a piece of bone that were similar in their shape and structure. So volume, you know, the amount of space that something takes up looking at that, okay? And these were the two of my collection of fossils that I were able to find that were pretty close. So if we're saying that cartilage, okay, um, and oh, that's a great point. I just got the request to actually make 
the video part bigger. So there we go. Hopefully that is better. Sorry about that, guys. Forgot to stop the screen share. So if we look at this piece of cartilage, now everyone can see this a little bit better, hopefully, in this piece of bone. If we are saying that cartilage is less dense than bone, what do you expect is gonna to happen to this piece of cartilage when I put it into this tub of water right here? Why don't you go ahead and make a prediction? A prediction meaning using your background information, your knowledge to make an educated guess of what is going to happen. And again, the key is we're saying cartilage is less dense than bone. We're also saying that sharks having a skeleton made out of cartilage is something that helps prevent them from sinking to the bottom. So what do we think is gonna happen to this piece of cartilage? Compared to what do we think is gonna to happen to this piece of bone? So I'm starting to see a lot of people say that this is going to float our piece of cartilage and the bone is going to sink. So let's find out. I'm gonna take my piece of bone first and I'm gonna slowly drop that into the water because I don't want it to splash all over my computer, okay? But then we are able to see our piece of bone sank to the bottom compared to our piece of cartilage, which is in fact floating at the top here, okay? I'm gonna hold this up so you can see right in at that water level, okay? So again, we are seeing how cartilage is less dense than bone, because bone has that higher density, meaning it has more molecules in it. There's more stuff inside that, okay, affecting its mass. Um, that piece of bone is sinking to the bottom compared to that piece of cartilage, which has less molecules in it, all right, meaning it has a smaller mass, is there floating at the top, okay? So this is one of the reasons, all right? So this is looking at the shark's you know, structure, it's internal structure, looking at its anatomy, all right, that actually, you know, makes it so that sharks aren't going to sink to the bottom. But remember, I said it's a combination of things. So it's not just the fact that their shark is made out of, scar of cartilage. We go back here, okay. The next part has to do, again, with their anatomy. Um, and this feature is that Sharks have an oily liver, okay? Now, part of their internal anatomy is having a liver, all right? It helps carry out some of their bodily functions. Um, you know, we have a liver as humans and it helps, you know, in our bodily functions. Um, and so the liver on the shark is a bit different than our liver because their liver is very rich in oil, okay? Um, and if I'm going to share a picture next that actually shows the internal structure of a shark. So if you don't really like guts or that kind of thing, you might just want to turn away for a moment. It's not too messy of a photo, but I want you to actually be able to see the liver inside the shark. Okay, but I do just want to give that disclaimer. The next photo is going to actually show you the inside of a shark and it's an actual photo, not an illustration. Okay, so if we look at this photo here. Okay, that's looking at the internal structure of the shark. I specifically were looking at the liver that we just said is rich in oils. Now notice how big that liver is, starting all the way up here and coming all the way down that internal cavity of the shark, this whole section. All right, we see that big piece of liver and guess what? There's not just one of those, the liver actually has a left lobe and a right lobe, so if we, you know, lifted up one of those livers, you'd actually then see that there was a second liver in there. It is all connected. Um, so truly it's one liver, but it has two sections, the left side and the right side. But notice how big it is, okay? The liver actually makes up about a third of the shark's whole mass for its body, okay? Um, so the liver is a large part, you know, it's one of the largest internal organs on the shark there. Um, and again, it's rich in oil. And this is significant, okay? We're going to stop our screen share here again for a moment so you can see everything better. Um, because when we look again at density, right? Oil is actually less dense than water. So I have a glass of water here, okay? And then I just have some cooking oil. 
So this is something after you watch today that you could actually try at home. Uh, make sure that you talk to the adults uh, in your household before you just raid the kitchen cabinet and take all of the cooking oil. Okay, I don't want to get any messages from parents saying, well, we couldn't cook dinner because of your experiment today. So before you raid the kitchen, make sure you speak to the adults at your house. Uh, and it's always good to have an adult supervise this kind of thing anyways. But so if I were to actually take some of this oil and we're gonna look at, and again, this is just tap water here, okay? If I slowly pour some in, because we're saying that oil is less dense than water, notice where all of that oil is going in this glass, okay? Notice that as I poured it in, all right, because of the act of pouring it in, some of it initially went down in the glass, but then because it's less dense, all right, that oil is all sitting on top of that water. So even in salt water, okay, we would see that the shark's oily liver helps it, okay, because oil is less dense than water to not sink from the bottom, all right? So, so far we have two things that are making it so our shark won't sink down to the ocean floor. That skeleton made out of cartilage that because of density, uh, cartilage is less dense than bone. That's going to help our shark to, you know, be higher in the water column. That oil, okay, that oily liver, I'm sorry, but that oily liver, since oil is less dense than water, um, you know, again, looking at density, that's also going to help the shark to be higher in the water column. But that's not all, okay? Um, there's another piece to this puzzle that helps a shark from sinking to the bottom, okay? And this last part has to do with the fact that sharks like to move it, move it, okay? If you were with us on Monday, we talked about the movement of sharks and how it is that they're able to move themselves through the water. And a big part of them moving is that it helps prevent them from sinking down to our ocean floor, okay? So to review what we looked at on Monday for anyone who might not have been able to join us, all right? A shark looking at their tail, that caudal fin there, okay? Um, the side to side movement of their tail helps generate what we call a thrust force. So this is actually gonna help to move the shark forward in the water column, okay? So they move their tail from side to side um, and that is gonna generate that forward motion for the shark. And then they also, as they're moving forward, they're gonna try to get water underneath their pectoral fins. So their pectoral fins being these arm fins, the one on the side of the shark here. And by getting water to go underneath there, it creates an unequal pressure compared to the amount of pressure on top of the fin compared to what's below it. And that's gonna help the shark generate lift. And lift is going to be that, for, that upward force that's gonna help the shark, I could see some of you thinking it, that's right, actually move up off the ocean floor. So as it generates that thrust force and starts going forward, it can get water underneath its pectoral fins, creating that lift so that it actually can move up. So looking at all of this, okay, you know, to answer that question, can sharks sink? Well, we know they have a skeleton made out of cartilage, since cartilage is less dense than bone, okay? You know, that's a benefit for them in their body that helps them to, you know, not be sinking down. But it's also the fact that they have that oily liver that is pretty big. Remember, we said the oily, the entire liver, that left and right lobe actually make up about a third of its weight. Um, and then we're talking about how it actually moves through the water. So by moving its tail fin, generating that thrust force, and then getting that lift, enabling it to be able to move up in the water column and not just sink down to the bottom. But a key to this is, remember, I said it's this combination, you know? So what would happen if the shark does stop swimming? So this photo from our friends at the field school actually shows you a photo of a nurse shark, okay? And this shows the nurse shark up near the surface and you can really see how that tail is swinging side to side, that shark is swimming. If that shark were to stop swimming, what do you think is going to happen? That shark will in fact sink down to the bottom. So nurse sharks are a bottom dwelling species, okay? 
And this photo really shows you several nurse sharks. You can actually see three of them in this image, actually even four of them. Um, but and this is a species that when you see them photographed, they often are hanging out down on the ocean floor. They're not swimming. And it's because they're not swimming that they are down on the ocean floor. Even though they have that skeleton made out of cartilage, even though they have that oily liver, by not swimming, it's causing them to be down on the ocean floor. So again, sharks, you know, it has to be this combination of things, all right, that prevent them from swimming. And when we talk about them, okay, being in the middle of the water column, that's, a, you know, their ideal place for many species to be. There are some bottom dwelling sharks like the nurse shark here um, that prefer to be down, you know, not swimming. They come to rest on the ocean floor. But for a lot of them, you know, what they're trying to create is what we would call neutral buoyancy. So if something is positively buoyant, that means it's going to be floating up at the surface. If it's negatively buoyant, it's sinking down on our ocean floor. Sharks don't necessarily want to be in either of those places. They want to be able to go up and down in the water column. They want to be neutrally buoyant. So it's these things that help them to be neutrally and buoyant, but it's these things all working together, okay? Now, I know a question that's likely going to come in is, can that nurse shark still breathe while it's, you know, not swimming and it's down there on the ocean floor since it's not moving? The nurse shark and other bottom dwelling sharks are able to come to rest because of an adaptation they have called a spiracle. Can everyone say that at home for me? Spiracle, good job. So we look at the eye of our nurse shark here. If we just go slightly behind that, you're gonna see that small hole. And what that is, is that's a special intake valve. So they can actually take water in that valve there, okay? And then that water passes over their gills and then that gas exchange of getting oxygen into their blood supply is all going to take place there, okay? So even though they're at rest, this species can actually still breathe. White sharks have to maintain swimming in order to breathe. They don't have a spiracle, okay? Now, a fun fact for all of you, as you may have heard, there's always an exception to the rule, okay? And there is an exception as we talk about, you know, how it is that sharks have that neutral buoyancy and looking at, you know, why is it that they don't just sink down to the bottom? Um, you know, the exception to the rule is this species right here. I'll move my video part here so you can better see. Does anyone at home know what species of shark are we looking at right now? A sand tiger shark, very good. So looking at this sand tiger shark, okay? Sand tigers can actually hover in the middle of the water column without, you know, swimming. So they're not having that thrust force and that lift generating that forward movement for them and maybe even an upward. They can actually just hover right in the middle of the water column. Now, from what we just talked about, that doesn't make any sense because we said that they have to be swimming. That's one of the three things that has to be happening to prevent the shark from sinking down to the ocean floor. But so the sand tiger shark does something totally different than shark species, okay? The sand tiger shark will actually come up to the surface and it'll gulp a bunch of air into its mouth and then it kind of swallows it down into its esophagus, into its stomach, and then it'll actually go down. So now it has, you know, this big bubble of air in its stomach and that helps them to have that neutral buoyancy and just come to rest. Sand tigers are known for being lazy. So this whole feature of gulping air at the surface and then coming down and just being able to hover makes it so that they don't have to exert the energy to, be, to have to swim in order to stay neutrally buoyant like that, okay? They're kind of cheating the system. And they really do, they come up with their, they get their mouths open at the surface. They make a large noise to gulp that water in and they swallow it down. And then they come down and after a while, they're gonna have to get rid of that air bubble now that they have in their stomach. If we have an air bubble or something in our stomach, how do we usually get rid of it? You know, when we have gas or something in our stomach? All right, that's right, we burp. So that's exactly what the sand tiger shark is actually going to do. They, as they make their way up, because then pressure is going to start to act and it's going to get really uncomfortable, the sharks actually then burp out that air, okay? 
So another fun question that now you know the answer to, do sharks burp? Sand tigers absolutely do, okay? Um, so they, they are the exception to this rule. And this is something I have not been fortunate enough to be able to observe in the wild. Uh, but I talked to a scientist friend of a scientist friend of ours, Dr. Jeff Kneebone, who's at the New England Aquarium in Boston. And as I was getting ready for our lesson today, he explained this whole piece to me, um, which is pretty cool, right? So these sand tiger sharks, and it's really just as he said, because they're lazy, all right? They're actually nicknamed blob sharks. You know, they have the ability to just hang out at rest in the water column not down on the ocean floor like nurse sharks, okay? You know, they're right there and it's because they take this gulp of air and then swallow it so it's down in their stomach and it enables them to have that neutral buoyancy. Again, neutral buoyancy being not at the surface, that would be positive buoyancy, not sunk down on the bottom, that would be negative, but right there in the middle, okay? So, Looking, all right, at this, if we were to review through this again and really trying to understand, you know, why is it that sharks aren't sinking down to the bottom? And again, it's that combination of things. So it's looking at the fact that they have a skeleton made out of cartilage. That's the first, okay? And since cartilage is less dense than bone, this helps them. They also have that oily liver, okay? And again, since oil is less dense than water, this is gonna help them to be a bit more buoyant, all right, being able to actually float. Um, and then it's that ability to generate movement, okay? They use that side-to-side -side motion of the tail to be able to propel and move themselves forward, which can also then help them to generate lift, okay? So can a shark sink? What do you boys and girls think at home? Yes, a shark can actually sink. If it's not continuing to have that movement, okay, then they will actually start to sink down like we start on that nurse shark. So it's looking at all these things together that help them to be able to, you know, have that neutral buoyancy and be somewhere in the middle of the water column, okay? Now, I know one question is looking at, um, you know, if we were to look at a whale, why doesn't a whale sink when we know that their skeleton is made out of bone, okay? Well, when we look at whales, whales actually have lungs. So when they come up to the surface to breathe, okay, and they take all that air in, that's what's going to help them, okay? And if we were to look at other fish that aren't sharks, if we were to look at that bony fish, they actually have something called a swim bladder, okay? And that is what helps them to be able to have that neutral buoyancy and be in the middle of the water column. So different marine animals have these different functions, okay, based on their um, anatomy that enables them to have neutral buoyancy in the water, okay? And for sharks, this explains to you how they are able to, based on their anatomy and physiology. Now I'm going to um, share my screen again um, because to follow up today's lesson, there are some things that you can do at home to explore density, okay? So one of the worksheets that we posted to our website is this sink or float. So again, you need to speak to an adult that you are at home with, all right? Because this is definitely not something that, you know, you should go off and do but on your own. Um, but if you were to get a bin of water, um, and so I just use, you know, this small Rubbermaid bin, so you can use something this size. Maybe it's that you fill part of your bathtub with water and you can use that for your experiment at home today. But then I encourage you to look around the house and actually pull different objects. Um, and then you can explore the density of them and how they compare to one another. And it can be really fun if you start exploring objects that are similar to one another. Like maybe you have a plastic utensil somewhere at home as well as a metal version of it. So maybe you have a plastic fork and then you have a metal fork. Um, so you can take those two things and compare the density. You know, Do they have the same density? Or what I was able to find is from a piece of Tupperware. I have a plastic lid here, but then from my honey jar, I have a metal one. 
So they're similar in their volume, okay? They're both the same thing, but they're made up of different things, which means the amount of molecules in them, looking at the mass, is probably different. So are they going to have the same density? So this worksheet has you actually list the objects that you are going to investigate. And um, as you list those objects, then you can make a prediction. Now, again, prediction being, you know, using your background information and your knowledge to make an educated guess. Um, and so make your prediction and then go ahead and start recording your observation on what happens. You can check off if the object sinks or you can check off if it floats. And again, you can try a lot of different things that you find around your house to try to explore the density of these objects. So this is a great investigation that all of you can, you know, go ahead and you can try doing on your own today. Again, please don't get me in any trouble before you take any household objects, okay? Speak to the adults that are home with you and make sure that everything you're about to put in water, you know, is allowed to be put in water. I don't wanna hear that anyone's cell phone got, you know, ruined in a density challenge or anything like that. Um, and something that you can do is you can absolutely investigate the density of liquids like we did here with oil and water, okay? So this is a fun one that you can look at. If you're going to investigate the density of liquids, something to be mindful of is that you want to pour things really slowly. Um, otherwise, you know, if it starts to mix in, that could affect your outcome. Okay. I hope everyone has a great day. Thank you all so much for joining and we will be back tomorrow. Have a good one.